Greetings from Tokyo. I'm Tripp, and welcome to the Hammer of Wrath. This week, you and I are going to paint a big miniature. Uh, a bigature? I don't know. Let's go. Thanks for joining me in the studio. We'll talk about Tokyo Disneyland in a second. When I recorded the intro video, even with my Bluetooth lavalier mic, it sounded like this. Greetings from Tokyo, I'm Trip. But I discovered through the Adobe Suite that you can run your audio through a program called Adobe Podcast, and it comes out sounding like this. Greetings from Tokyo, I'm Trip. I don't know what to say. Uh, that's absolutely incredible, and it changes absolutely everything. Now, I went and bought some sound absorbing panels and a new rug. I'm not gonna show you the rug because it's ugly. It's absolutely hideous, but it's the only one they had in stock that was the size that I needed, uh, so I bought it. I also upgraded my microphone. Even though I had purchased a very expensive Bluetooth lavalier mic, the sound quality still wasn't where I wanted it to be. And it's likely that having discovered this AI program, even though I've upgraded my mic, I'll also run the audio through that. So. Hopefully this sounds buttery smooth. Now let's talk a little bit about Tokyo Disneyland. The park is fantastic. If you think Disneyland is a bit too big, this one's only a little bit smaller. It is way cheaper to get into this park. The last time I went to Disneyland with my family in Los Angeles, um, it was about $170 a person for one day. That's crazy. Tokyo Disneyland, again, is not much smaller, so there's a lot of the same stuff. Of course, you don't have the Star Wars Galaxies area and, and the upcoming Marvel area and things like that, but there is a brand new expansion of the park that is all based on Beauty and the Beast. There's an absolutely incredible ride. They have a second castle, guys. There is a whole second castle in Tokyo Disneyland that is more elaborate, just more picturesque than the main castle, if you can imagine that. It only cost us $60 US to get into the park. The other amazing thing about Tokyo Disneyland is that it doesn't close. In the dead of winter, mid-January, when it is sub-zero temperatures, you can still buy a ticket and go into the park. I, I would never do that, that's bananas, but it's pretty amazing that it stays open year round. Today's video is something special. It's taken me a little longer than I thought it would. I've already broken my schedule of posting once a week because what we're about to do today took me two and a half weeks to complete. Kind of bit off more than I could chew, but I'm really happy with the way that it turned out. Now, I've always wanted to paint Imperial Fists, but I don't need to start a fourth Space Marine Army. Yeah, no, I don't need to start a fourth Space Marine Army. So instead, I found this absolutely incredible model on Colts, printed it as large as my printer would allow, and painted that instead. So, let's check it out. I found this knockoff of Tor Garadon on Colts 3D. It's meant to be printed at 28mm scale, but I needed as big as I possibly could. I also found this really great head. The model included a head, but I like this one better. As you can see, it barely fit in the print bed and the statue itself and the base were as large as I could possibly make them. I removed the parts from the raft and the supports, and the head came out especially well. If I had been smart or experienced at all, I would have created a join for the neck in my 3D application, but I forgot, so instead had to drill and file one. Now I'm gonna use super glue to assemble this. I use these little one ounce tubes from the dollar store because I can use them up before they dry out and clog. The model was obviously designed to be printed in 28 millimeter scale, because when you blow it up to this size, the thickness of the purity seal and these leather straps, that just don't make any sense. In order to make this easier to paint, we're only going to assemble the power pack and the right arm, leaving off the head and left arm for separate assemblies. I then prime the model using rattle cans in yellow and on the base, white, in order to get maximum coverage as quickly as possible. We're gonna be working primarily in yellows, but the secret is this, pink. You're gonna have to trust me on this one. Using the airbrush, working my way across the model, I apply this in any area that would receive a shadow. And it ended up looking like this. It really feels like we ruined the model at this point so early in the game, but a simple application of Uriel Yellow and we see what's happening. 
the pinks actually transform into rich golden browns through the semi-transparency of the layer paint. It's absolutely transformative and will add subtle dimension to the model that we wouldn't normally have otherwise. The last thing we're gonna do with the airbrush is to apply Flash Gets Yellow to all of our highlights. Once the base yellows were complete, I used poster tack to cover the arm to protect it while I applied a coat of dark gray to the cloak hanging over the right shoulder. Using the airbrush and getting complete coverage, I then moved on to a light gray to do a highlight pass. And using the same light gray, I brushed on the highlights for more definition. Lastly, knowing that this warrior has seen the dust of a thousand worlds, we used Beastie Brown to spray on some dirt along the bottom of the cape. The next step was to prepare an oil wash. Here I'm using some rather inexpensive oil paints from the art store. I'm mixing some Van Dyke Brown and some black together in small measures and adding mineral spirits that will thin the paint. Now the important thing here is to use brushes that are separate from your acrylic brushes. You cannot use the same brushes you would use for acrylic paints. You must keep these separate once you've used them in oils. Once it's fully mixed, I just apply it over the model generously. 20 minutes later. Using makeup sponges or cotton swabs, remove the oil wash from the highlights, working your way around the model. Now the great thing about this technique is as you wipe down, you'll get this incredible streaking and grime in between the panels that not only defines the shapes, but also ages it. The next step was to add chipping to the armor. I'm using a dark gray here to indicate areas of distress or damage to the armor where they might come into contact with stones or other obstacles or just be worn over time in the course of battle. Next up were the metallics. I undercoated everything in a dark gray for better coverage because metallics over yellow just don't work. I use Games Workshop's lead belcher as it gives an incredible single coat, smooth finish. And once my metallics were dry, I applied an all over wash of Games Workshop's Agrax Earthshade. While I waited for the Earthshade to dry, I moved on to the base and using an airbrush, applied a dark gray and then highlighted each tile with a lighter gray. I then applied an all over wash of known oil to bring out the recesses. Next, I airbrushed the earth underneath the stone and then applied an all-over wash of Agrax Earthshade. It's okay if we get a little overspray from the airbrush here or some of the wash spills over on the stone because honestly, we're going for a realistic look and this isn't a coloring book. It's okay if the colors blend together. Especially in a battlefield, you are going to get dirt everywhere. I then dry brushed the tiles and the statue using a series of lighter and lighter gray values to bring out the highlights. I dry brushed the earth with Karak stone and also applied that to the model. I finished the small details like ejected shell casings and added some additional brown wash to the base. Once the wash on the metallics was dry, I began dry brushing it with a highlight of canoptic alloy to bring out all of the high details. I then moved on to the plasma coils, painting them in a sky blue and then applying a wash of Gulliman glaze and then the sky blue again in order to bring the coils back to full brightness. Once that was set, I painted the casing of the weapon and also added some sponge aging as well as a dry brush to create a glow effect. Once that was all set, I went back and used white to highlight the coils in order to give them a glass appearance. Knowing that it's a plasma weapon, we want to add some heat damage here. So using three washes, Seraphim Sepia, Riken Flesh Shade, and Drucci Violet, we apply our heat effect. Next, I moved on to the leather straps, applying three layers of Steel Legion Drab. And once that was dry, using a mix of Steel Legion Drab and white in order to create a lighter color, I added scratching and wear and tear to the leather straps and the belt. I then applied lead belcher to the ends of the straps, as well as the rivets within, and then shaded them with Agrax Earth Shade. Moving on to the other insignias found on the model, I painted them in black, highlighted them with a medium gray, 
and then did the fine tips with a light gray. I then painted the purity seal using a combination of khaki, Carrack stone, and burnt umber. Colored in the wax seal using a red, and then applied Games Workshop's contrast blood angels in order to fill in the recesses. While that was drying, using a triple zero brush, I moved on to the script details themselves, creating a drop cap, an inquisitorial eye, and an aquila at the bottom. I rinsed my brush, got some steel leaves and drab, and then began indicating the text. Certainly a lot easier to paint something like this at this scale than it is to try and do so on a 28 millimeter miniature. I then highlighted the wax of purity seal with red and moved on to the lenses on the power pack. I applied a coat of black, then using a light blue gray, created an underglow, and then a second layer with an even lighter gray, and then ended with a single dot of light on the corner of the lens. Next, I applied the decals, making sure that my surfaces were completely smooth I have a separate tutorial for this, you can find it on my channel as well. Applied the decals, pressed them to the surface, and then used decal softener in order to help straighten out any wrinkles or creases on the decal. Once the decal was dry, I applied two layers of Lamian medium in order to remove the gloss of the decal and blend it more closely into the model, and then added some additional battle damage and wear and tear using a sponge and some yellow paint. I primed the head and started by applying a base coat of dark elf flesh, and then from the top down, light flesh to establish my basic shadows. Then I applied an all over wash of Riken flesh shade. Looking back, I would have cut this one to one with Lamian medium so that it didn't turn out so dark. Once the wash was dry, I began applying a combination of dark elf flesh, light elf flesh, and pink to create custom flesh tones all over the model, mostly on the highlights here, bringing out the cheekbones, the nose, the upper lip, and the forehead. Normally, I don't paint the eyes on 28 millimeter miniatures as it's just not worth the headache, but given the size of this one, I figured it was necessary, so I went ahead and used some ivory white in the eyes, never a good idea to use a pure white, and then very carefully, using a zero brush, use some brown to create the iris, and then finally, a triple zero brush to create the pupil in pure black. I base coated the hair using a dark charcoal gray, which gave me excellent coverage. And then once that was dry, I applied a dry brush of brown to the hair to bring out the highlights. And finally, a brush of select highlights with beastie brown. I then painted the collar in metallics and began the arduous process of applying the five o'clock shadow. I did this by applying very thin layers of known oil. In total, it took 15 layers. Finally, I painted the service studs on his forehead, and he was complete. Well, that turned out better than I expected. Certainly best face I've ever done, but that that's kind of cheating given how much larger the face is than those tiny, tiny 28 millimeter faces. And now I have this amazing display piece for my den. Maybe we'll do something like this again in the future. If you'd like to support the channel, please just like, comment, or subscribe, or, or maybe share the videos on your social channels. You can always check out the Patreon linked in the description below. In fact, I need your feedback on that. Are the different tiers worth the price that I've set them at? What should I include? What should I change? Leave a comment below and let me know, and I'll take any advice you can give me. I'm looking forward to creating more amazing content for you, so please look forward to the next video, and I'll see you then.